One of the cool things about woodworking is that there are a hundred different ways to do the same task. Now this can also get us in trouble because we tend to get set in our ways and think that the way that we cut dovetails or mill a board is the right way and the only way to do it. If you close your mind off to new techniques and new approaches, you might be missing out on an opportunity to improve your skills. Now, when it comes to dovetails, I'm one of those people that's just not looking for a new way to do things. I don't have any problems with dovetails. I don't fear the dovetail joint at all. My dovetails come out fine. And if for some reason they don't, I know how to fix those gaps pretty easily. So when David Barron contacted me and said, I want to send you some of my dovetailing guides, I kind of told him outright, I said, you know, I'm not really a fan of guides. I don't really like the idea of using guides. I kind of think they're like training wheels. But I said, you know what? I gotta, I gotta take my own advice. I can't get set in my ways. Let me try a new thing. So I said, yeah, go ahead and send them over. And I wanna share with you my review and whether my opinion has changed on the whole training wheel thing or not. First, let's look a little bit closer at the guides themselves. They are, um, I think this is anodized aluminum. They've kind of gone through a couple iterations over the years, or I think David used to make them just out of, out of wood. Now he's got this very slick uh, aluminum here. And he sells the guides in, what is it? One, two, three, four, five different angles from one to four all the way up to one to eight. Again, this is a one to five. He also sells a 90 degree angle and a 45 degree angle. The secret here is that there are these really powerful rare earth magnets in the side and a saw sticks right to it. It's a really, really firm grip on it. On top of the rare earth magnet is this ultra slick uh, high molecular weight plastic and it allows the saw to just slide right over it. It also sets it away from the aluminum just a little bit so that any saw set there may be is not going to be scratching up the metal here. It's on both sides. And then on the inside he's got some sandpaper stuck on here that just kind of holds it to the board a little bit. 90 degree angle is the same, sandpaper on the inside, and then the slick plastic on the side. I've got my tailboard locked up in my front vise here, and probably one of the first differences you're going to see in using one of these guides is the layout. Since this locks in the angles and everything, all I really need to do is scribe my baseline here to know when to stop cutting and a location to start each cut. So I just laid this out by eye, visually cut it in half, and then cut those parts in half. So I'm gonna have uh, four tails here. And then it just made little tick marks about, I don't know, about a 16th inch away from those lines. So I take the guide and I set it up so that the angle is gonna be cutting from the top left down to the bottom right. And I can just slide this over so that the guide matches up right with my tick mark. The saw just sticks right to the blade and I'm going to want to really press this firmly in place. I don't want this guide to shift. And I make the cut. And this is really weird for me because the, the angle and a lot of it may be that I'm used to working with Western saws, but the angle feels really wrong for me. And the way my body is all out of alignment, I, I just know that this cut would be terrible. But the magnet is really holding the saw in place. So despite the weird body mechanics I've got going on and maybe some of the angle being wrong here, it works. But I also find that it is really difficult for me, I don't know whether it's a lefty thing or a righty or what, but it's really difficult for me to actually see my baseline. From my perspective of looking down here, the guide actually gets in the way of the saw kerf and I can't really see. So I have to really kind of lean over and, and look down there and it only exacerbates the feeling of terrible body mechanics. But again, this is one of the things that's cool about this is everything is just locked in the place. Not only is it locked at the right angle, but it's locked at 90 degrees right across the board. And anybody will tell you that is the most important thing with this particular cut is getting it 90 degrees across the thickness. 
If you have a wedging action with your tails, you're never going to get a good fit. You may also end up splitting your pin board when you try to fit it. So I just have to get used to the, the feeling of, of god-awful body mechanics here. And just trust that that magnet is holding everything in place. And, you know, from the test cuts and the times I've used this in the past, it's safe to trust that because my, my cuts have come out perfectly. Now, here's another thing that is a little weird for me, but you have to flip the board around now to do the other angle. And immediately, in my mind, from the way I'm used to doing things, I'm just rebelling at this point because it's ah, just another step. But now that I'm flipped around, I can saw the same way, the same angle, same process and everything, but now I'm sawing the opposite side of the tail. So there is something to be said about the consistency of your body position, <laughs> despite the weird mechanics. A lot of times, anybody who's ever sawn dovetails before, you'll have one side that's preferred that you're really, really accurate with, and the other side is it's a little bit, the other angle, I should say, is a little bit weird. This way, at least we're locked into the same angle the whole time. It would help if I made complete saw strokes here instead of just dibbling at it. It goes a lot faster when you use the full length of the saw. You do have a lot of precision here because of the, the weight of these guides and the strength of that magnet. You really can dial in exactly where the kerf goes. It is interesting though that this saw, it almost isn't deep enough under the back. A lot of times I'm actually bottoming out when I come in here. So there is some limitation if I had really thick boards here. This is just a three quarter inch thick maple. If I was a full inch or an inch and a quarter thick, this saw wouldn't be deep enough to make those cuts because of the added thickness of the guide. I'm close to bottoming out here just going to this three quarter inch deep baseline. Now from here, everything is, is cut out. So I'm just going to use my fret saw to saw out the waste. The fret saw is nice because I've got a really fine blade on here to begin with. And the Japanese saw cuts a really fine kerf. But I can come in and turn 90 degrees with a saw and really work right down on my baseline to knock that out. Now, that I would just repeat across. And to saw out the, the half tails or the half pins or whatever on the end, I could just come in with a saw and work right down to it. But since I have this 90 degree guide, I'm going to give it a shot. So this is a little bit awkward because I can't really see my baseline, my knife line. So what I'm going to do is slide this right up to the knife line. And again, let the magnet grab it and just let the guide control it. And sure enough, 90 degrees right across the face and the tail pops off. So that's, a, that's handy of having the 90 degree. You know, if you were looking to get a set like this and you're trying to decide, do I need multiple dovetail angles? Maybe just stick with one dovetail angle and spring for the uh, 90 degree guide to help you. If you struggle with getting these cuts on the end accurate, this will certainly help you with that. You can see my angles here are, are just beautiful. Nice fine kerfs, nice and square across the top. And it's just a matter of sawing out the rest of this waist. And if I leave just a tiny little bit behind, it doesn't take much to chop that away. In fact, I've got so little, I'll just go right in my baseline. It's 
Chop from both sides here. My base lines are ever so slightly wider than the chisel I have here. So I have to come at it a couple hits. But that right there chiseled in and essentially I just need to repeat that for these other two spots here and the tailboard is ready to transfer over. Now some of you may be thinking, I don't think I've ever seen you use a Japanese saw before. You need to be right. The only Japanese saw I own besides the one that David sent me is a flush cut saw. I am a Western saw kind of guy. So the question is, can you use these guides with a Western saw? Absolutely, with a butt. In use, using a Western saw is exactly the same. You set your guide up against your line, the magnets grab the saw, and you go to work sawing. The magnets are strong enough to hold this heavier, thicker plate saw, but the biggest issue is the depth of cut. On a typical dovetail saw, like this beautiful Bonds dovetail saw, I don't have enough clearance under the back. If I remember correctly, this is like one and a quarter, one and a quarter at the toe, and it's a canted saw plate, so it's like one and three eighths at the tail. That doesn't get me very deep. I've got a relatively thick piece of poplar here. It's about 15, 16 thick, but this would be typical of uh, a carcass or a case piece and I'd be doing dovetails, my baseline's all the way down here, and you can see that Bont's dovetail saw only, it bottomed out on the back, eh, about a quarter of an inch into the wood. So I've got all this material that I can't reach using the guide and this skinnier dovetail saw. But I tend to like bigger dovetail saws anyway, so when I reach for my dovetail saw of choice, this is a, a stiletto by Bad Axe, and I make a cut with that. Bottoming out on the back, and I'm still not to my baseline. I'm probably three quarters of the way there. I've got a cut that is about a half an inch deep, so I've still got a good quarter, quarter plus inch to go. The stiletto, again, it's a canted blade. It's uh, about one and three eighths at the front and about one and three quarters at the back approximately. It's a little more than one and three eighths at the front. So this is a, a, a pretty sizable dovetail saw, certainly its length, but this is a pretty uh, fair amount under the back. And um, one of the, I think it's actually the largest dovetail saw I have as far as depth under the back. So in order to be able to make a heavier carcass dovetail cut like this, I've got to go to something that's not a dovetail saw. And that's fine. This is a, another bad axe saw. This is a, um, uh, what uh, Mark calls his small tenon saw. It's got his hybrid filing on here, so it works uh, really well in both rip and uh, cross cut. So now I've got a substantial amount of wood, or excuse me, a substantial amount of saw plate that is under the back and I can get down to my baseline and still have a, a lot of material left. Let's see, I'm probably a good 3 8 inch of saw plate still uh, below the, the back here that would allow me to make a much deeper cut. So if I were doing even bigger dovetails, say you're doing um, workbench dovetails or something, you could probably still get away with it. But frankly, the bigger the dovetails, the bigger the saw you're gonna wanna use anyway. I would probably use more something like a larger tenon saw for cutting big workbench style dovetails because then generally the, the thicker the board, the, the deeper things are gonna be. You're gonna need a much heavier saw like a tenon saw with you know, three inches of clearance under the back. But the point is, Western dovetail saws work just as well. It's the exact same process. Got my tailboard all cleaned up. And one of the things that I really like that David Barron has brought to this uh, dovetailing technique is this alignment board. It's nothing more than uh, two dovetailed boards put together at a right angle with a fence. And when I drop it onto my bench here, I can line everything up against that fence, it makes the transfer real easy. So what I do is come in and 
set my pin board flush with the top here. Just lock it in with my front vise. And with it pressed up tight against this fence, this tailboard just slides in and out and I can very easily line things up exactly where I want them. Use a marking knife to trace in the locations of my pins. Now just like when I was sawing out the tails, you'll find that you actually don't have to trace the entire tail because again, the guide is, well, guiding everything. All you need is a tiny little mark to register the guide against, to register the saw against, to saw that out. But just like with any dovetailing, you wanna make sure that you are marking your waist because I don't care how accurately the guide positions things, it's up to you to position. And if you position it in your song on the wrong side of the line, you're gonna end up with gaps. So normally I would transfer my lines down the face, but again, because I'm relying upon the guide to saw 90 degrees and everything, I'm not gonna do any of that. I'm gonna go ahead and move the alignment board out of the way. Tighten down my vise and I grab my guide and now because I'm not sawing an angle across the face, I'm sawing the angle across the thickness, I've got to position, flip this around. And again, I need to remove the inside of the line. So what I'm gonna do is move the saw up, drop it down so that I'm squeezing up just to the inside of that knife line on the waist side of the knife line. and I'll saw down to my baseline. And I'll repeat this across the board. So the guide is taking care of the angles and the plumb nature of the cut, but it's still up to the woodworker to position it accurately, to position it on the right side of the line and to position it, you know, whether you're splitting the line or leaving the line, and that really will depend upon the species of wood you're using. Maple is quite hard, so it's not gonna compress very much. So I'm actually splitting the line in this case. If I were doing pine or poplar or something, I would probably leave the entire line just because the wood's gonna compress a little bit more as I use a mallet to bang the joint together and I'll end up with a tighter fit. And just as before, to do the other angle, I have to flip the board around. So it still feels a little awkward to me to have to do that, but that's just years of you know, sawing right to a line. So this is definitely something that takes a little bit more getting used to. Now, I flip the board around, but I have to flip the guide around as well. So it's on the opposite side, but again, make sure you know where your waist is, and I'm positioning the saw on the right side of the waistline. It's a testament to these guides that despite the, just the horrible body mechanics going on back here that want to pull the saw off the line, the magnets keep it in line. The guides have done their job. I can put those away. Now it just comes down to, again, sawing out the baselines with a fret saw and chopping down to my baselines. That is no different than whether I use these barren guides or not. But that's everything chopped out. I've got my pins and tails ready to go. So let's see how we did. 
already I can feel that kind of snugging together. That is a really good fit. I've got a little bit of a gap right here that tells me that I probably didn't position the saw exactly where it needed to be because it's a perfectly uniform gap, but I mean, I could close that up with uh, a little bit of scrap wood in a second. The baselines look really, really good. Um, and certainly I'm not, I didn't get any wedging action. There's no danger of splitting anything. I've got pretty much a machine fit here. So, you know, you really can't argue with those results. The question is, are we shortchanging ourselves on our skills? By allowing the guide to just kind of take care of the sawing for us, are we improving our sawing skills? I would tend to say no. Uh, because of all that horrible body mechanics I was talking about earlier, you're not really training your body to saw straight. And to me, that's, that's kind of a problem. Sawing really is the most important skill. If you can saw accurately, everything else becomes easier. But on the flip side of this, you know, if you don't do a whole lot of handwork and you just cut hand cut dovetails, this can be outstanding. It also can be a great way to get you started in hand cut dovetails and take the sawing part out of the equation and allow you to really focus on getting those baselines. You know, there's certainly a lot of people who have trouble sawing the angles, but I think more often than not, you see gaps along baselines that's due to chiseling. Certainly the gap that we're seeing here is indicative of the fact that these are not they don't just put everything on autopilot. There is still a lot of a human element to make a perfectly tight joint. So I don't know that I would go so far as to call these training wheels because I could still make a really crappy looking joint, but at least the angles will all be consistent, right? So, you know, I think that there's some merit to having a guide like this in your, in your kit of tools when you really need to make sure you get just that perfect joint. But, I urge you to not rely on it entirely. I gotta say though, there were some kind of visceral reactions when I was doing this that just made me not like the process of having to rely upon the guide. Every now and then I would drop the guide in place and realize I had it the wrong way. I needed to flip it around and go backwards because the, the saw wasn't gonna cut the right angle. I'm so used to seeing a line and sawing to the line and that skill, that ability to do that, that confidence and that freedom to do that is I think one of the most important things you can have with hand tool woodworking. This fights that and I felt like I was being slowed down every step of the way. I felt like I was second guessing myself. That is probably more an indication of somebody that's used to cutting dovetails without one of these guides. So I can't really put that as a con against it. Overall, I think this is a pretty cool tool to have around. And I would track my statements of saying that it's a bad idea and that it's purely training wheels. And this just goes to show you, you really need to branch out and try some new techniques from time to time. So I wanna say thank you to David Barron for sending me a bunch of these. One thing that really comes out of this, this 90 degree guide, I love it. I will use this one a lot. There's lots of times when I need to make sure that I've got an exactly square line. For that matter, I think I'm gonna pick up the 45 degree kit as well because I could see lots of times when I'd want an exact 45 degree angle. If I'm doing like cope and stick joinery on frame and panel, having that cope joint in there or having that 45 degree joint that I could then cope or miter together would be great on a really, really small scale. So, you know, I urge you, if you're struggling with your dovetails at all, think about picking up some of these and uh, see how it works for you and your dovetails.